everyday heroes, ready to level up your game in your daily battles against villains, monsters, or the pesky squirrel who keeps raiding your bird feeder. Today we're dialing up the adrenaline with a deep dive into one of the more exciting aspects of everyday heroes, chases and races. Unfortunately, the Everyday Heroes rulebook has left a lot of the rules intentionally vague, and while that might suit some game masters, if you're watching this video, you're probably looking to fill in those blind spots, and I'm here to help you out with that. But first, let's look at the rules. But don't let the word rules scare you, these are just frameworks. It's up to us as a game master and our heroes to fill in the cinematic details. First thing we're going to look at is chase turns. Chase turns are like your slightly odd looking siblings of famous celebrities, just different enough to be weird. You've got your standard attacks, yes, but those come with special limitations. You don't want to swing a sword while riding a motorcycle, do you? Well, actually, yes, who wouldn't, after all? So, while attacking during combat has limitations, which we will get to, let's talk about some other actions that you can take in a chase turn. The brace action, picture it like this. Your heroes readying themselves for a sprint, double nodding their boots, perhaps checking their GPS for the fastest route out of danger, or maybe taking some deep yoga breaths. That's bracing. Bracing gives you advantage on your next ability check or saving throw involving a complication. It's like the game's way of telling you, hey, it's okay to be cautious, even when you're being chased by a gang of emo street thugs. Gain ground. The gain ground action is your chance to gain a leg up, metaphorically speaking. Involving an ability contest, this is where you either play the villain, making things tougher for your opponents, or the hero, making it easier for your team. If you win the contest, your team gains a chase point. If you fail spectacularly, well, the opponent gets a chase point. In the event of a tie, everyone gets, no, nothing. It's a harsh world after all. Combat Limitations Let's discuss combat limitations. These are the traffic laws of the chase world, and breaking them might not land you a ticket, but it sure will get you in trouble. Limitations are imposed on ranged melee attacks and movement. Think of them like physics in our otherwise physics optional fantasy world. First up we've got combat range. Now the range of visibility in the chase can vary widely based on circumstances. In most cases the range is within normal range of normal ranged attacks. However, shooting from a moving vehicle or a mount, that's tricky stuff. You'll be rolling with disadvantage, so choose your moments wisely. Next we'll talk about melee attacks. As much as you'd love to bop your pursuer on the head, melee attacks are mostly a no-go. The phrase is usually busy just trying to avoid the getting caught part. But hey, I'm not here to crush your dreams. Melee attacks could be possible in specific circumstances, and that's up to your GM. Now it's assumed that everyone's out of each other's reach in a chase which does put a damper on opportunity attacks and other reach dependent actions. However, if you get a creative GM in some truly cinematic circumstances, exceptions might be made. Let's talk about movement. It's a chase. You're always moving. But the actual movement isn't measured and the regular effects of a move don't usually impact the chase. Dash actions or actions that affect movement, like the disengage action, don't always make sense in a chase, but if the GM's feeling generous, they might allow these actions to give advantages or affect the chase in some other way. Next we have the Michael Bay segment of the chase, area effects. Explosions, spells, and other flashy stuff can be used during a chase, with the impact being determined by your benevolent overlord, I mean GM. Remember though, while they look cool, they only last around, and always remember to duck for cover. Movement penalties. Think of them as the equivalent of spraining an ankle during a marathon. They slow you down and they grant your opponent chase points. Ending a chase. This can happen in three ways. When the timer runs out and the side with the most points wins, everyone on one side drops out, meaning they literally drop out of the race, or one side leads by a predetermined amount, making them the Usain Bolt of chases. Now let's take a look at one way a GM might interpret these rules to run an actual round of a chase. But stick around after, because I'm going to give you more options that you can use to make your chases even more dynamic. Alright, buckle up. We're about to embark on an epic chase through the streets of Phase Landing, featuring our intrepid hero, Alara the Agile Rogue, Thorin the Hardy Dwarf, and Magical Marvin, the less than athletic wizard. On their tails are the dastardly villains, a trio of wolfmen named Fang, Claw, and Pup. The chase starts on a bustling marketplace street. The chase DC for this setting, let's say 14 because those apple carts and street vendors can be tricky. 
Each hero and villain has a chase score starting at zero. Alara, always quick on her feet, opts to gain ground. She rolls an impressive 18 on her dexterity acrobatics check against Fang, who rolls a dismal 8. One point to the heroes. Thorin, being the stout fellow he is, decides to brace, prepping for the inevitable cart complication. Marvin, the nervous Nelly, attempts to gain ground action, but trips and fails on the roll. Remember, in the everyday hero's chase system, failure can be as costly as success is beneficial. The villain gets a point. On the villain's turn, Fang uses gain ground, rolling a 15 on his strength against Alara's 12, another point for the villains. Claw, true to his name, decides to get aggressive and make an attack, but remember, he has to deal with range limitations. He uses a special Wolfman leaping attack, but rolls a 1. He lands in the aforementioned apple cart. See, Thorin, racing really does come in handy. Pup, being the smallest, tries to use gain ground with the stealth roll, but Marvin spots him easily. No points gained there. Now you probably noticed how I had each move contest by an opposing player during fa the phase landing chase. And you're curious about that initiative business. That's not in the book. Well, the book as I mentioned is pretty vague. Let's peel back the layers of this gaming onion, shall we? In many classic tabletop RPGs, initiative often dictates the order of turns, like a well-rehearsed dance line. But in a chase, oh, it's more like a dance off. And in the everyday hero's chase system, it's not just about who goes first, it's about interaction and reaction. That's why each move was contested. Let's start with our hero's turn. When they made a move, I had a villain oppose it. Alara made a gain ground move, Fang was right there to contest it. Why? Because the chase isn't a monologue, it's a dialogue. A very fast, sweaty dialogue. On the villain's turn, the heroes got their chance to oppose as well. It's a back and forth that adds tension, suspense, and a sense of immediacy. You're not just watching the chase, you're in it, dodging those metaphorical apples. As for initiative, I didn't opt for the strict order here. Instead, I let the narrative flow dictate the rhythm of the chase. The heroes act, the villains react, then the villains act, and the heroes react. It's a dynamic tango rather than a scripted waltz. You could, of course, employ traditional initiative rules, or even have the villain act as a party, but in this example I wanted to showcase the fluidity and flexibility of the chase mechanics. It's like jazz, and who doesn't love a good jazz chase? But let's discuss some other options for initiative. Option 1 is the single initiative. You can treat the predators as a single unit, all of them taking their turn together, like a conga line of doom. It's simple, keeps things moving, and you won't forget anyone's turn. However, beware, because when the villains all act at once, the results can be like a gut punch for your heroes. Option 2. For those who love juggling knives or scheduling meetings, there's always the individual initiatives. Each predator gains its own spotlight, its own initiative, and takes actions independently. It's a bit more work for you, the Game Master, but hey, you chose to be a Game Master, right? And it can make the chase feel more dynamic and less predictable. Next up you could do grouped initiatives, a sort of middle ground. Predators are grouped based on their type or role, each group acting on its own initiative count. Think of it like a boy band. They all sing together, but they have solos too. Finally, we have the predator leader initiative. This one's for when you've got a really big bad wolf leading a pack of not so bad wolves. The leader gets his own initiative while the rest act as a unit. This option puts the spotlight on the big baddie while keeping things relatively simple. Alright adventurers, let's talk about the spicy part of the chase, complications and hazards. Now you could go the classic route and have a static hazard that everyone has to leap over each round, but to me that's like serving the same dish at every feast. Tasty, but oh so predictable. So let's look at some options to turn hazards and complications into an all you can eat buffet. First up we have grouped hazards. Imagine your chase being interrupted by a wizard spell that's gone awry. The chase field warps and shimmers, teleporting everyone a random distance backward or forward. The entire chase field must make dexterity saving throws to navigate the magical mess. If the party fails, they might find themselves closer to the pursuers, and that's a chase point for the bad guys. Next we have individual hazards. Picture this, you're dashing through a magical forest, and the cunning Will-o'-the-Wisp tries to lure your hero off the path with its misleading glow. A successful wisdom survival check will keep you on track, but if you fail, say hello to an unplanned detour and a chase point for team antagonists. 
And how about some one-sided hazards? The villain has some goons tossing barrels in the way, but conveniently forgetting to block their own path. Your heroes will need to ace those ability checks, or they're tripping up and handing over those chase points. And then you could always have split hazards. The chase leads to a forked path. The thicket on the left, or the swamp on the right. It's a tough call. Each path has its own unique hazards, different ability checks, and chase points hanging in the balance. But remember folks, complications and hazards aren't just there to torture your players. Well, not only for that anyway. They should present fair challenges that can be overcome with good teamwork and quick thinking. You know, just like in real life. Only with less rogue wizards. Alright folks, that's all the time we have for today. I know, I know, it's hard to say goodbye. But before I go, I do have one more thing to ask you. If you found this video helpful or just plain fun, please give it a big thumbs up. And if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button. Help this channel grow, be a part of the family, and I promise I'll bring you more exciting content right at your fingertips. After all, every like, every share, every subscription, it's a point for Team Viewer, our favorite team. Till next time, have a great adventure. Thank you.